What is the most memorably f***ed up reaction you've ever elicited from a client? Early in VaynerMedia, we went into a meeting and the gentleman saw that I was wearing jeans and a hoodie and he viscerally delivered Thanks for dressing up. That's the wildest part of the story. We won the business and he was an early investor in Resi because we became so close after that meeting. Again, that goes back to compassion and empathy. I could have met his negativity with negativity. I chose not to, and it's led to a very fruitful relationship. I'm a child of the 80s and uh, I'm, a, I'm a Laker fan. That was sort of my first touchstone into American pop culture that was you know, a huge part of my identity growing up. So I didn't know that my future partner would be Shaq, who was my favorite athlete growing up. For you, is that, is that Mark Gastineau? That's a great, great one. Mark Gastineau was huge. It was Al Toon and Don Mattingly. I was a big baseball fan as a kid, the Yankees. So Donnie baseball for sure. Um, but, but the Jets kind of quickly took over in my like 10, 11, 12 year old world. And Al Toon, number 88 for the New York Jets, was my guy. I don't know if you're allocating any more equity, but I feel like Altoon and Don Mattingly would be down for just like maybe a, a silent partner seat on the Vayner Media board. I think you're right. I think <laughs> I did quite well uh, convincing them that being in business with me would be a good idea. You know, it's funny on that point. Um, I think a lot about um, being more thoughtful of reaching out to people post Kobe's death back to your fandom. Yeah. You know, literally several weeks before that, my friend Rod hit me up we went to Qatar together before the world cup for some business reasons. And he meant, he called me. So I got to know him, you know, those long trips, a couple of days, you get a little closer than even normal business acquaintances. You become friends. And he pinged me like a couple months earlier. And he's like, dude, Kobe's listening to your podcast. He like, likes what you're about. And I'm like, this is fucking amazing. And I was very like, you know, like, I don't like the pressure. I don't like to push too hard. I'm like, Oh, come to me. And then obviously the tragic death. And I remember being very effective. I'm like, you know what? Like it's actually happening actively with Mike Tyson. I'm like going out of my way. They want me on the podcast. Mike Tyson was top five for me. And we've never met. Um, ironically, I saw him driving through the airport the other day in Miami, like on the cart, like, hey, watch out, watch out. I'm like, is that Mike Tyson? And so like, I'm going out of my way to make sure I show up on the podcast. Um, I think a lot, you know, I, I don't even know why I'm telling this story other than for everyone who's listening, if there are people you admire or you like, you know, I've always been great at doing it on DM. I usually do it for kids that are coming up. Like, I love that. Like the high school kid, you know, Victor, who's going to go number one in the NBA draft. I think yeah. I'm, for four years, I'm like, if these videos are real that I'm seeing from France, you're going to be really crazy. Good luck, kid, you know, or a hip hop artist. I love doing that shit, but I don't do it for the people that I grew up, or like I've never reached out to Don Mattingly or Al Toon, and I think I'm inspired and will do so after this podcast. We're around the same age. I feel like as, as we talk about cultural moments and these kind of big shared fan moments, no one will really understand that the feeling a few minutes before a Tyson fight Oh my God. Is such a second to none electric feeling want, of danger hear, and excitement. Please. You want something crazy? My teeth chatter. To this day, it didn't happen with the Garcia and Tank fight, but it did happen with the Wilder Fury fight. To this day, my teeth chatter only in two scenarios in life. The moments before a huge boxing fight that all happened to me because of the Tyson thing and double overtime playoff hockey if I care about the game. And I've come to recently realize why both are the same. They're the only sporting events that can end out of nowhere with no preparation of the shock. I get it with MMA too. Right. Playoff hockey, you know, baseball, extra innings, a run cut, like a home run, a game winning. This is why walk off home runs are so iconic in baseball. You don't have that in football. The drive is coming. You could, in theory, a shocking turnover and ends it, but. That's so funny you say that. I've thought about that my whole life, how how insane that those three, four minutes before the fight starts, it just shakes me to the bone. Yeah, we just talk about like a high that we try to recreate in our lives. That's definitely one for me. I feel like, you know, one unique, as I was, you know, I was texting Shaq and I was thinking about what we were gonna talk about. I'm like, you know, Gary and Shaquille actually share a unique thing in common, which is that 
in very different ways, but equally meaningful that fans have sort of forged these relationships with you over time. You know, you, you mean something to people and you have this outsized presence in people's lives, which complicates their ability sometimes to relax and be human when they actually get the chance to meet you. I wonder if you just tell me a little bit about the skill as you've raised your profile over the last 10, 15 years of receiving love from people who are struggling to communicate because maybe you make them nervous or it's sort of affecting their ability to speak English. Shaq's incredible superpower amongst 600 of them is humility. Yes. It is not something I would know had I not gotten to know him. It is 100% the same for me. You know, it's not very easy to figure out through my content and how I roll publicly that humility is a core strength. The, the answer to your question is, when you have humility, you're almost embarrassed when people are so pumped to be around you. So for me, out of almost embarrassment, I'm overly aggressive to try to get them to be as comfortable, like the speed in which I go to like touching on the shoulder, like trying to self, be self-deprecating, make a joke, like God, like whatever I can do to speed up the mo that moment, which, you know, to your point, as your profile grows more and more, it's like super, I kind of like it more. I'm looking at Madison Square Garden. We're talking basketball. I like it at like, I was at Cleveland last night. Like I like when it's masses because really it's just like quick, like, hey, can I get a selfie? Oh my God. Like that's like easy. When I'm like doing a book signing or like appearing, like that's where you get it, right? Because the person, like you've got like two, you got a two minute interaction. So the first, like, and I'm, I'm incredibly uncomfortable with it because I think when you're humble and that means you had great parenting and I know Shaq had it and I know I had it. Um, you're uncomfortable in it. You're like, oh my God. Oh, and you're also like grateful. Like, I'm just so grateful. I'm like, my God. Like, look, this, I can give you the talk track. Boom. I cannot believe I live a life where someone is crying right now. I cannot believe I've done enough good or interesting stuff or clever enough stuff or creative enough stuff that this person is like genuinely nervous. And I get a double weird one that I is interesting and I'm flattered by. Many people tell me, that they had never before froze up or felt weird or starstruck. And they were even like surprised it's happening. And I have spent a lot of years on this and it got me to a place of like, Shaq is like a transcending superstar beyond like really famous people, not me, are almost completely untouchable and have escapism value. Like, like, I love listening to your music when I'm down. Like for me, sports, it lets me balance all the craziness of my life. For me, I think a lot of times people like me because I've added something tangible to their perspective or mindset, which I think is why people get caught off guard when they meet me. Because when I talk to those people, they're, they will say, I admire you, which is different than I think you're incredible or I can't, you're me. Like, you know, like admiration comes when you're like deeply actually doing something for someone. And so I'm very humbled by that, you know, like, and so anyway, to answer your question directly by being borderline embarrassed and by wanting them to get the most out of the moment. Cause the other thing you feel pressure on is there's 800 people in line. You know, you're only at this place for three hours. Right. And you know that the handlers of the event at the bookstore, the event are about to move this person. And if they spend their entire time, you know, like, you know, being enthralled, they may not get the question out. They may not get the picture. And so I feel like this quadruple pressure of like, well, this is awkward. Like I'm, I'm embarrassed, but I'm humbled. Uh, oh crap. I better help this person get what they want from me right now. So that's a sense of responsibility. And so it's, it's a fun mix of like, just trying to get them to be as comfortable as possible, as fast as possible to maximize the micro moment. No, it's an interesting distinction with Shaq. You meet Shaq you know, I'm not nervous around celebrities anymore, but I still get nervous around Shaq just because you will never meet a larger fucking person. Exactly. And that is so off, it's so off putting, even if you've been around him a hundred times, but he's, so you meet a guy like Shaq and he's an alien and you're a human and he's been this source of escapism. With you, you have been additive in helping people with the thing that we're generally trying to escape from. Um. And then you sort of think about the ways people approach you. And there's probably a bell curve, which is like, you know, to the far right, 
man, people probably come really, there's probably a handful of people who come really correct. Like they have the perfect joke or the perfect reference that just disarms you. And you're like, man, and, and they, and they well, kind of drop I'm, it and, and I'm, walk. I'm, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I'm disarmed at scale. One of the things that has happened the last five to seven years is my profile has grown is I've had far more conversations with other people with high profiles where they ask me how I roll. And what I've realized is, and this is what Shaq has. Shaq is very unique and um, and I associate with him. Shaq is by default, genuinely likes people at scale. Yeah. And I have that. So like, I don't even need to be disarmed, yeah. right? Like literally to your point, people coming correct to me is everyone as long as they don't have some deep venom and negativity, like really overly confrontational, which is by the way, one in a million, right. six times. And like, you know what I mean? Like, so I don't have disarmament, but to your point, they it runs the gamut of how people roll. Yeah, I will say a lot of people go way too fast into, can you give me a hundred thousand dollars for my start? <laughs> you know, like that's when people like, I always am fascinated by how did we not even get to hello? And they try to do it clever though. Yes. The big pitch is the following, Gary, nice to meet you. I'm going to help you buy the New York Jets right now. If you give me $400,000, I'm going to return that like your Facebook and Twitter and you're going to buy the Jets. And like that almost never works because it's like, too aggressively selfish in a micro moment without even like the hello, what's good, you know? Listeners, if you're out there, notice he said that almost never works. It means it sometimes fucking works. I mean. Well, I'll tell you why, to your point. I am overly empathetic and I'm like, fuck, if you know this person may rightfully think, hey, this is someone I've always wanted to invest in my company. I may never see him again. He's walking through the airport, like fuck it. And so like, I'm not like, the lack of judgment of how anybody rolls up to me is a great gift I have. I'm very grateful for that. It just makes me happy all the time. I'm just not bothered. And to your point, like if I've got that 38 seconds to two minutes, it's it's occasionally possible that the person says something that's interesting. If somebody said to me, hey, I've, I've built an AI tool that ingests long form creative and outputs short clips like you do across the board, which a ton of people are working on and I've seen a bunch already. That's probably gonna get my attention today if I'm walking through the airport. And I will say, email me at Gary at VaynerX.com and I may invest in that company. Like you're right, it may happen. Yeah. And, and part of the empathy is probably, you know, unlike a five-star athlete, unlike Victor, unlike a, a lot of musicians who were sort of prodigies in their teenage years, like, you know, you probably never want to lose sight of being able to, uh, to some degree, see yourself in that person. You've been that person who probably had no shame, who rolled up to people. I'm going to ask the question, what's he going to tell me? Fuck off. And he tells me fuck off and I never see him again. Well, it's funny. It's funny. So a couple things. A, that was a very brilliant observation. Because I didn't grow up ever thinking I would ever have anyone ever know who I was outside of like, and there he is, the, 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 Gary wins the businessman of the year at Springfield, New Jersey. Like I thought I'd be a <laughs> businessman and like there'd be a gala and people like, oh, you're good. But like, I never thought any time before the age of 30 that the world would know who I was at scale. So to your point, there's that. On the flip side, no to people, yes to business. So I was very good at ringing doorbells and saying, do you want me to you know, shovel your driveway for five bucks? It just snowed nine inches. I was very good at like, business rolling up on people. I have a little bit of a weird nuance where my family like was taught to like stand on your own two feet, never complain and kind of don't ask anybody for anything. So I actually, here's an interesting insight to me. I don't really raise capital. I actually envy, which I don't envy, but like I admire my friends who are able to raise capital. So I'm actually not great. I would never be the person that would pitch someone a business in the middle of the street. It would never happen. But I would ring, I would sell something like if I, because I believe in it, right? Like I knew that the people were ripping me off by paying me five bucks to shovel snow for an hour. I just thought five bucks was like a billion dollars back then. I was like, fuck it, let's go. So, you know, there's a real mix of nuances there if you want to get into the insight, but I don't judge it in the negative if someone does it back to your prior poll. And to yep. your prior point, unlike Victor, who probably, or Shaq, though Shaq loves to tell the story that he wasn't that great in high school, it at least crosses mind that he might 
get good at basketball. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, for these people, to your point, like if you were aspiring to be an athlete or a, or an actor or a musician, it has crossed your mind multiple times in your youth that people are gonna think that you're gonna be famous. For me, that was never, I was gonna be a businessman, a good one, a big one. Maybe the Wall Street Journal would write about me, but that means like people I know would be like, cool, you did it. Not like strangers know who you are. And so that's absolutely right. right. And by the way, I might be a last of Mohican. Let me throw something at you that I thought about literally yesterday in Cleveland. I'm like, wait a minute. The amount of people that are going to be able to be 30 years old before they even make any content on the internet, right? 35, be, be a grown ass man, 35, like at least emotionally and like have responsibilities and children and a business and, and then only be like, wait a minute, people are going to know who I am. I better be prepared to deal with that. Every nine year old on earth now, every 13 year old on earth wants to be famous. They want to be a YouTuber. They want to be a podcaster. They want to be an influencer, a creator. It's almost like we won't have humans anymore that don't think that they're going to be, no, you know, like, it's like, it's like, even by default, even if you're like, I'll never want to be, you know that you might be, you know that you may post something one day and everyone will know what it is because it went viral. It's really a whole different world. I mean, going back to Neanderthals, isn't it the the, the human condition that, every generation believes that they're the absolute height and peak of civilization. We won't get into AI a bunch here, but as, as all of these questions of AI come up and you just hit on it in, in a slightly different way, but I'm like, well, okay. Like when AI is accessible without the use of a device, um, when the information of the world is accessible without the use of a device, which it's, which is I on its that. way, which then. Is, which is here, right? Alexa. It's here. Alexa. Well, by the way, a text message is telepathy, but I'm saying like, now take the device away and like, I can, you know, when I have access to the text message without needing the phone, the phone is in my DNA or connected to my ear or whatever the case may be, like where we're headed. My point is like, we want to believe we're the butterfly, but like, we may be the larva. The butterfly may look back at us and be like, man, that was so fucking cute. Like they had fire and a wheel and they thought they had it all. No, not, not. Not will they like, or we, they may like, it's 100,000%. It's the law of the universe. When people are like phones and social media, I'm like, do you understand in 40 years, the iPhone and TikTok and Facebook are gonna be the mundane? Like people thought they were flexing in the mid nineties with like a cellular phone that looked like a cup of coffee yeah. and like a big antenna, no texting. Like, I mean, I mean, do you understand some of the things we accept today that would have been insane? Could you imagine 20 years ago telling parents, guess what? In 20 years, you're gonna want your 14 year old daughter to go into a strange man's car to go to places because that's gonna be safer than them driving. The concept of Uber is insane 25 years ago. Do you know how many 13 year olds take Ubers to the mall now in high net worth neighborhoods and like, people would have like, I mean, it's insane. And that's just consumer behavior or 25 years ago, online dating was for like dudes that lived in the basement of their mom and it was like the least cool thing. And that's social norms, not even technology. Tech, to your point with technology, like, oh man, I mean, 50 years from now, everything we're doing now is gonna be laughed at as like amateur hour. Yeah, I, I think there's a fate to it that again, it's it's hardwired into most of us to be resistance resistant to change, um, even as change is the law of the universe. And and so, you know, it feels like we're like protecting our species. But again, like our species is is in this state of constant evolution where, exactly, just the ways that we define a human. You know, you think about even like education. Like education for us was the memorization of facts. What happens when every kid has all of the access? in all the world at a, at their fingertip, then like, what is it even to be educating? It's like, all of these things are, and I'm, I'm happy I live right now. I think maybe that's the takeaway of what I'm saying. I'm, I'm happy I get to be here in this moment. Me too, because you don't get to make that decision because we're too small as an individual human. To me, I'm happy about everything. Yeah, this is also why it's impossible to talk to you because I could, this, we, we could talk about seven different subjects. Okay, I'm gonna get this shit back on the rails. This is an advertising podcast. Okay, all right. So I saw you in Cannes. 
this year, uh, speaking alongside Greg Hahn. They gave you guys like 20 minutes for the two of you to interview. Is very, very, very poorly thought out. Maybe give them an hour. Um, I saw you at the A list this week. Um, I see you more prominently, your company more prominently and consistently in the trades and at the award shows. You know, I think you know as you're as you're building your stature in the advertising industry. You know, there was a there was this really cool rebelliousness and sort of outsiderness um, that that you retain. Um, but you know, most who are in your position sort of rose the ranks of the ad industry and developed this kind of reverence along the way. And of course, your story is quite different. It's quite different. I, I wonder what was your relationship to the industry when you entered it, and how, if at all, has it has it changed now that you're you know a decade in? Um, I didn't know anything about it. You know, which ended up being a gift and a and a and a slowdown. I tend to like the concept of fresh eyes can innovate. So, and I'm also a bad student. So, like once I decided I wanted to start an advertising consulting company, which is what we really called it at first, I just said to AJ, like, "Hey, we understand startup. I understand small business. We know nothing about Fortune 500. We're going to be doing this for 80 years. Let's like." figure it out. Let's just, people are starting to reach out to me because I have a lot of Twitter followers. ESPN and Pepsi just pay me $5,000 for an hour of consulting. That seems like a ton of money. Like, let's figure this out. And so we came in very naive. It was about community management at first. Like brands were not replying on social media. Brands didn't have accounts. The NHL, I was watching uh, the Rangers game the other night and I saw the at NHL Twitter thing as a promo. And I was like, AJ's laptop created that account. My brother's laptop created at NHL for Twitter. Like it was that early for social in 2009. My relationship was naivete. When we started doing media and creative from day one un underneath the umbrella, I didn't realize that Madison Avenue had split it to separate companies 20 years earlier. I never heard of Nielsen brand lift studies. I didn't know about Cam Lions. I didn't know about Ad Age. I'd never heard about a firm. I never heard about Martin Sorrell. I didn't know who David Ogilvy was. When I tell you nothing, I was a poor student who was 100% obsessed with wine from the age of 17 and to build his dad's business. And my interests lied in um, you know, sports and music and Jersey. And I, I was interviewing someone for a very senior role last night. This kid literally grew up idolizing marketing, right? Like he was like, I read this book and Fallon this and DDB and Ogilvy. And I was like, this, and I was, I thought it was the neatest. I was like, this is so rad. Like <laughs> I, that wasn't my journey. I didn't know anything, but I knew that marketing had built my dad's business. And I knew that social was going to win. And I knew that big companies believed in something I didn't know, but I had a sense that it wasn't right. Right. And, and we got in and very quickly, early meeting at Campbell's and Trident and Mondelez Cadbury. I was like, oh, okay. And then like things started happening, which was, I realized television was God. And I real, and that was weird to me because the internet was cruising. And I, and like, and then, you know, it took me about five or six years to calibrate the industry. And what I mean by that is like, I'm like, oh, okay. Like how you measure media like matters. Like they might not even believe in programmatic digital ads, they might not believe in television, but GRPs and impressions and MMMs and MMAs is like why they do it because they're a corporation and they have to conform to that. Oh, creative, like this is all a facade. It's all about awards and headlines and it's just people's subjective opinions and they don't really validate them. And and just like, you just start like really, but, but to the point of creativity, the creative is the variable of success. I believe the Super Bowl is the best ad in, marketing in the world, best buy, underpriced, 100 million Americans will consume it, it's what we do. But your upside is based on how good the ad is. The process to the ad is something I have challenging DNA towards, but the punchline of the concept is right. And so frequency, frequency and reach, I agree in that. The problem is I believe in actualized reach, not potential reach. So a GRP means nothing to me because I know it's fake. Yeah. It's fucking fake. Like, you know, and so same with a social media view, by the way. I have no love towards social media other than I think it's underpriced attention. And I think the industry hasn't calibrated it yet. But, you know, my relationship was knew nothing, believed in my thesis. So I wasn't scared to speak my mind, which of course, you know, was a different narrative. And I'm empathetic to why the industry is like, 
especially the way I roll, tons of confidence, tons of conviction, tons of passion, and I'm willing to like challenge the status quo. I didn't whine. I just come from 15 years of challenging the wine industry, yeah. which on a good day makes the advertising industry seem easy. Like you yeah. want to talk about pretentiousness, you want to talk about ideology, you want to be, you want to talk about focusing on the past. I would literally taste wine that I knew was below par, and the winemaker would say, to, the owner would say to me, "My grandfather built this." I'm like, "Your grandfather didn't make this wine." This wine you just made, like, had to deal with the fact that it rained and you picked the grapes too late. Yeah, you know, when, I don't, when you're when you're you know, when you're at that ad age event that I saw you at this week, do, do you feel at home? Yes and no. Yes, from the standpoint, I'll, I'll tell you about the ad age event. I really so I left early, and I left early because I had some business stuff and family stuff, not for any other reason. Some people hit me up, they're like, "Oh, why'd you leave?" I was like, "I wasn't leaving because I'm like, I, I came because I want. I love being part of this industry." I'll tell you what really threw me off. I can't believe how disrespectful the industry is to the industry. I was talking to my tables. Uh, we had two tables for Vayner. I was very upset. Like genuinely, I literally said to one of my industries, I'm like, this industry really has a lot of work to do. I'm like, we are at the main industry event and we are not even staying quiet out of respect. Like there was just no respect for the winners I was really upset. I didn't say a damn word while those people were on stage talking about thank you, thank you for like, it. I was shocked. I'd never been. We won a bunch of good stuff last year, but I wasn't able to come. I don't recall why, family or travel that was already locked in. And I, I said to my COO, I'm like, um, cause he, Mark Yunkin, he he actually accepted war list. And I'm like, was it like this last year? He goes, yeah, he goes, I was nervous to like give the speech before I got here because you weren't here. And I was like, fuck, I can't do what he does. And he goes, but then I was like, not nervous at all because I realized nobody's paying attention to anything. So I did not feel at home from the standpoint of it reinforced to me the thing I continue to want to challenge our industry to do, which is we can be nicer and better to each other. Yeah, everyone's waiting their turn for their moment and not giving a shit about anyone else's moment. At that event specifically, which is, some of it is just the programming. It's it's too many people. You got people who haven't seen each other in a long time. They're trying to catch up while someone I, is on I'll, stage I'll, trying to I'll, say something I'll, profound. I'll be honest with you. I fully disagree with you with all due respect. We had a full hour beforehand. Yeah. I've been to, I'm involved in a lot of industries. You know this. I've got my yeah. hat on a lot of things. This industry needs to look at itself directly in the face based on what I saw at the gala last week. To not have the cordialness to not have the respect, to not have the empathy and the compassion towards each other for when someone's getting an award to be quiet for four seconds and let them thank their teams. I was on the ground shocked. And my team knows that I have a lot of feelings towards the way this industry rolls. And I went over and I'm like, this is another example of where we can all be better. We could be better at treating our employees better. I don't think this industry does a good job. I really don't. And I think the lack of respect towards each other at the gala was shocking and we need to be better. You just said the magic word. Anyone who's seen your content knows that your management philosophy can be boiled down to the word empathy at the center. You spread it, you espouse it, you bang the drum about it. it's importance today more than ever. Is there, I love it by the way, and it is it has rewired my brain. Um, and I think it's helped a lot of people I wonder for you, is there is there a scenario where empathy is particularly difficult for you to practice what you preach? When people come in with gobs of entitlement. If you ask me, where do you feel most challenged, Gary, to deploy empathy? No question. I'm so triggered by my upbringing to be anti-complaining to the extreme, too far. My family took it too far but I'm giving you a vulnerable, honest answer. I am most challenged to deploy empathy when people roll in with obnoxious entitlement. Not micro entitlement, because I think anyone who lives in a first world country, <laughs> you know, in a big city is met with entitlement at scale right now. It's hard out here. Um, there's a lot of entitlement, um, but gobs of entitlement, delusional entitlement is definitely when I bite my inner cheek. But then, but honestly, back to like, I'm so proud of this. This is kudos 
to Tamara and Sasha Vaynerchuk. They did a really good job. I'm able to bite my inner cheek and go into deep compassion, sympathy and empathy mode and go, well, they might've been brought up by parents that really spoiled them or they might've, or they might've, or they might be overcorrecting for the things that they're upset with in society right now. And we're going to fight the machine. Like I'm very, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a very happy man because I'm very quick to not judge. I think judging people is a disaster. And I'm very quick to go into, and this is why I think I'm a good marketer and a good salesman. I'm going to put my feet in their two shoes right this second. And how did I get to asking for some delusional ask? Oh, I know how. I grew up in an environment that didn't think that that was a bad thing. <laughs> I'm a creative at heart. Um, when your name comes up in creative circles, I think one of the great curiosities is your relationship to creative. You know, Do you enjoy the creative part of advertising? Are you looking at decks? Do you creative direct on occasion? How, how hands are, are you, how hands on are you in the making of shit? I have too much humility to get confused, which I think is a huge confusion in our industry that my opinion is that important. Now I do believe I have good subjective creative decisions. It's why I've been a fantastic investor. It's why I've been able to build brands, but I'm too scared to act as if I'm not playing baseball. I believe the best CCOs in our industry, if they are meant to go into the Hall of Fame, not the bullshit Hall of Fames that we've created in advertising that everybody gets into if they buy a table, but I mean, really, on merit, will go three out of 10 on their subjective opinion in a looking at decks and listening to pitches. I think most CCOs in our industry act like they're right 12 out of 10 times. Mm. This goes back to Shaq's superpower of humility. I think humility needs to be championed in this industry. So how uh, I am obsessive, hands in the dirt with my team on the process to creativity. I'll give you a for instance. I am championing from Rob Lenoir, or CCO down, that when a lead creative has to make a subjective call in a meeting for the pitch, for the idea, that we're at that moment, right? That you've been in many times, that they must, Announce, hey, six people I brought on the new business team. Hey, four teams that work on this account. It is now time for me to unfortunately, to be in the unfortunate position to make a subjective call to allow us to move on. That is outer space different than what's happening all across creative agencies around the industry right now, where the person acts as if they're the only person that knows, they're the great Pumbaa, all these ideas, you're lucky, you know, and you know this, this is something I want. I think the industry is loaded with creative people. And I think the process of the industry has extracted happiness and creativity out of them. So, you know, for all the creatives, I've come to this industry to help you. I know a lot of people think I'm the bad guy. You're not about the work, Gary. I'm the most of, about the work. I'm not about the work being done the way that people are crying in bathrooms, feeling dejected eating shit for 20 years until they can then be the person that does that and then treat everybody bad because they were. I'm not in that game. I'm not in that game, but I'm in the game of creativity. I think creative is the variable of literally is the variable of success. But on the media side, I'd like this creative to actually be seen. I do not believe most commercials are seen. I do not believe most banner ads are seen. I don't believe most social is seen. And on the creative side, I'd like us to have more humility that we are making the best guess that we can of the moment with our skills and experiences, but let's make all the people around us feel good about it, not douchey about it. Yeah, I mean, as a guy in my early 40s, I think about the big creative directors when I was a young creative, and it was a little bit more of the Bobby Knight school of management. And I think, you know, those days are over and the creative directors who yeah. succeed today are the Steve Kerr, you know, um, yeah. and it's, yeah, go ahead. Ish. Yeah. Ish. Well, there's a lot of Bobby Knights trying to be Steve Kerr's and it, it doesn't feel quite right. And they're, they know they can't be assholes anymore, but it's, they were overcompensating early in their careers. And then, man, you, you know, sometimes you feel like what got you there. Sometimes you feel like the thing that got you there, you know, you think it's what got you there, but sometimes you got there despite that behavior, not because of it. And to your point, I think there's another thing. Let's call a spade a spade. One of the biggest things I hold my leaders accountable to is when the times get tough, we need to be nicer. 
So back to why I was saying ish over and over as you were talking, I apologize. I apologize to everyone. I get super excited in these formats and I know I can get <laughs> in there. It's just the way I roll, I apologize. Um, my biggest concern about the ad world is when the, the creative director gets, when the CCO gets an email from the CEO or the managing director and says, we might be put up for review if we don't have a good creative meeting tomorrow. They've been Steve Curry, Steve Kerr-ish for a few weeks, but they come in guns a-blazing when the pressure comes on. I don't need peacetime generals is what I tell all my leaders. I'm like, of course you're gonna be nice when it's good and easy and we're doubling in revenue. Show me what you do when the pressure's on. Show me what happens when you get a phone call that says you're, you, we've, we've, we're firing you from the business. Do you then go and just make everybody else feel like shit? Or do you capture all that negativity and reconfigure it in your body and deploy compassion to your team? I think that today, Thursday, April 27, 351 Eastern, 2023, that there are thousands of people in advertising making people feel like shit this exact second. I know this to be true because I talked to everybody. I talked to a lot of people, brother. I talked to a lot of people. You know, some of the people that most famously shit on Vayner Media in Fishbowl and in LinkedIn and on Twitter are the ones who are most trying to get into the building. You might, I mean, I can't even get into it with you about your your relationship to online criticism over the years. I actually feel like you must have landed on this platform of empathy because as you develop your online persona and create so much content, people's responses can can be offensive and strange and revolting. And it's almost like you have to choose what you're going to stand for because you're actually responding to you're you're responding to things that no human has really interacted with before just by being sort of a first generation content creator in this way. It's, it's again, another opportunity for me to just like the way my mother built me, it was like, I was like, I, I genuinely believe I was the human being meant to be first gen public figure, this world, like brother, when someone says you're a piece of shit and I fucking hate you. Like the, all I can do is think, man, I hope they're like, I don't even know how to go anywhere. I don't feel like I'm a piece of shit in that scenario. I feel like that person's hurting. Yeah. You know, like when we were starting to get going five, seven years ago here, like when, you know, maybe actually, let me ask you a question. When do you think this industry, and maybe it hasn't even happened, but I have a sense it has. When do you think this industry realized, oh, wait a minute, it's not Gary and a couple of interns. Oh, wait a minute, this is not a blowhard. Like this company might actually do okay in our industry and like, we should stop laughing and making fun of them and start realizing like this might actually be a thing. When do you think that happened? I think the honest answer is when you started showing up on the lists and award shows that the that the traditional industry still right. holds in, in esteem. Fair enough. So let's say that's five, six, seven, eight years ago, whatever that is. You know, to me, what you know, what was happening during that time was just like when people were upset about it or this and that, like, you know. And we were started interviewing really serious MDs and ACDs and CDs and like the industry to your, like the first 200 employees of this company knew nothing about anything about anything about nothing. Like, like this, it was all like social media in a time that nobody knew social media. I couldn't hire anybody from the world of advertising. Nobody knew a thing about social. When we made that transition, you know, it, a lot of people would say like, like funny things like, Hey, you know, I pro they think I see, you know, they think I see everything. I see a lot, but not everything. Like, hey, before we start, I want to apologize. Like, I didn't really mean all your commercials are dog shit. I was like, oh, I didn't even know. <laughs> worry about it. Like, and like, what you learn through that whole process is, of course, people are going to be upset at Netflix and Hollywood until it wins. Of course, everyone misunderstood Tesla in the car. And anytime someone does something different and there is momentum, and you can't stop it, the only thing you think you can do is make fun of it. Yeah. I'm always aware that, do you know how many people made fun of me for launching a website in the wine business in 1997? Brother, this sounds insane. People literally laughed at me and my father for opening a website when I said in a specific, this is an insane story, in a meeting with 10 partners of my dad and his co-op, one of the partners, they owned a different store, but they were all part of this group. And they said, Sasha, he's, they've known my dad for 20 years at this point. Why are you launching this website? My dad didn't have a real answer because they didn't know I was driving it. So, but he's the best. My dad looked at me and he goes, Gary. I was like, 
I was like, cause it's gonna work. And they were like, but like, why won't you open a second liquor store? And I was like, and this is it. I can't wait for kids to hear what I'm about to say. And I said, cause it's gonna do better. And when I tell you the laughing in that room was as loud as Eddie Murphy's best <laughs> joke in his stand-up career's reaction, I literally got laughed out of the room, but I wasn't affected because I was laughing back. I was laughing back, brother. And so like, how do I deal with it? When an ACD at McGarry Bone, big shout out to McGarry, I'm just picking one, or a CD at 72 and Sunny is like, you don't know anything. I'm not mad, I'm not sad, I'm smiling because this is business. Vayner Media won't, I remember one, Vayner Media won't be here in three years. Okay, ACD at some, like, <laughs> as, as it, like, like, it makes me laugh. I'm like, do you understand that I'm a businessman? Like, does everybody understand that I came from wine retail and in 13 years have built one of the largest independent global advertising agencies in the history of the industry? Yeah, and and now you have this kind of outsized presence in the industry, and I, I wonder how that manifests in terms of client expectations. Do your clients have sometimes unrealistic expectations of how much you should be showing up personally? Like you know, like your participation is not meeting what they signed up for when they hired Vayner. Or reverse. You show up too much. No, I don't show up at all, and we tell them that from day one. Hmm. And by the way, maybe in the first three, four years, but nobody gave a shit if I showed up. It's like at some level, everybody was trying to figure me and it out for the first five years. And by the time they figured it out, we're on year 10 with Pepsi, ABI, you know, like seven com, like almost everyone comes to Vayner because of word of mouth or moving from job to job, not because they think Gary Vee is cool. If they think Gary Vee is cool, or they can take a selfie with me and at the airport. I can see them at can. Nobody's giving us business because of Gary Vee. If anything, the Gary Vaynerchuk of this whole thing is the most interesting thing for me. Gary Vee has been a detriment to my growth at VaynerX. Right? Because I say a lot of things a lot of people don't like me to say. When I, I mean, I on the record believe that 99% of commercials that are produced in this industry and distributed are an obnoxious waste of money. That's not helpful to your creative presentations? It's definitely not helpful to the way that many see it. Forget about the CCO at Havas. I respect her or his opinion of that. That's their craft that they believe in. Why would they like that? They shouldn't, I get that. But we can disagree. I respect if they don't think social is a good thing. I, that's a problem for me with every CMO. Every CMO in this industry cares about that. You mentioned a couple agencies. I wonder for you, what's an agency or two who, who's doing it right in your eyes or who impresses you? All of them. And Come on. Me, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. I have to say all because the only other answer I have is none because I don't know what anyone's doing. And the truth is it's, it is all of them because for example, this is, this is the, because I don't have time to breathe, let alone read the trades, I'm not up to date with who started agency, who's hot, who's not. I try to figure it out. I can name them. I'm way better than I used to be because I have so many senior people that grew up in these places sure. and they love the, the gossip of the ad world. And I'm, it's not like I'm against it. It's just that, man, I don't have time, bro. You know, like, like, and so to me, like, first of all, I'm a weird dude. I'm like a sports dude. I want to beat everyone, but I want everyone to win too. It's kind of like, you know, after the game, everyone's hugging, but if you're a diehard fan, you're pissed. Like when the Jets lose a game and they're hugging the Patriots, I'm like, you fucking assholes. Don't even talk to them. Get in the lot. But in real life, I'm the same. Like, like when Steve Stout gets a win for translation, I'm like, let's fucking go, Steve. Like I'm pumped. Even if I was in the pitch, of course I want Vayner to get it. What am I an ant? Like I'm not, you know, who wouldn't? But I have this great, the world is abundant point of view. I don't think anything we lose, we lost a Foot Locker pitch yesterday. I didn't even, I don't know who won, but I have this like weird, great energy where I'm like, good for them. Like kudos, good. Like, so when I say everyone, I kind of mean it. You know, like, like 
The problem is I can't speak to it because A, most of the currency of this industry is based on the industry deciding they made good commercials, not the consumer. And I am super foreign from that. I hate that shit. So right away, I'm in a weird spot because I can't really judge on the only conversations people are having. Um, but anyone who's got customers that are happy with them and who are treating their employees well, I have huge love for. And I'd like to think that that's at some level in pockets happening everywhere. And and so that's kind of how I see it. I just don't know who's doing what or how, who's winning, who's on fire. I didn't, you know, full disclosure, I didn't know quite a few of like the company, even the companies that were named. Um, but it's not because I think I'm too cool for school. I don't know a lot of shit. I don't know most shit. I spend 100% of my time trying to figure out what humans are doing at scale. So I know what's going on in popular culture, but I don't really know what's going on in the industry. I'm not a B2B guy, I'm a B2C guy. And I think this industry is very B2B focused. Everything's insular. Gary, we end every episode with the same three questions. Are you ready? I'm ready, sir. Question number one, what is the word or phrase of advertising jargon that makes your skin crawl the most? I'm all about the work. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, in a client presentation of your work, this could be in the wine industry or the advertising industry, what is the most memorably fucked up reaction you've ever elicited from a client? It was by not being, not wearing early in VaynerMedia, I, we went into a meeting and the gentleman saw that I was wearing jeans and a hoodie and he viscerally delivered, thanks for dressing up. Man, now <laughs> if you dressed up, you would look like a total asshole. Well, that's the wildest part of the story. There's two other wild parts. We won the business and he was an early investor in Resi because we became so close after that meeting. Because I, uh, for a different podcast, I'll explain how aggressive I was in response, not directly then, but later in the presentation. Um, so again, that goes back to compassion and empathy. I could have been shut down and counter- I could have met his negativity with negativity. I chose not to, and it's led to a very fruitful relationship. And the final question, man, I don't know how you're gonna answer this because you seem like a guy who kind of manifests everything that's in your mind, but it's called the one that got away, which is to creatives, I ask, what is your favorite marketing idea or campaign? For you, let's just open it up. What is your favorite idea that for whatever reason, it, it just never got sold, it never happened, but it's an idea that you still think about sometimes that lives in your heart? It's not an idea because it's different. I don't think in campaign terms, I think in more operational marketing terms, we started a sampling division, <clears throat> sampling six, seven years ago, eight years ago, nine years ago. I didn't put enough effort on it. I was battling on too many fronts. We just started media in an aggressive way. Uh, Sonny, the, the, the gentleman who's running it was very transparent. He's like, I'm gonna do this for a year and I'll move on. I thought I could get it going for six months and then figure it out along the way. It, it, it dropped, we closed that division, it failed. We have never gone back to sampling. And I believe in sampling so much. I believe in getting people to try your product as like the greatest way to market. And I feel like there's an incredibly contemporary way to do it between social and delivery and last mile. And like, I, I before I die, I need to make sure Vayner sampling is successful. So that's the one that's gotten away. Gary, like millions, you've had a outsized presence in my life. Um, over the years, you've inspired me and entertained me and provoked thought. And now as an entrepreneur, being in all these sort of high stakes scenarios for the first time, your content has a sort of uncanny way of finding me when I need it. So I'll just end by saying thank you for shaking up our industry. And uh, I think the nicest thing I can say to you is, man, I really fucking hope you, you own the Jets someday. <laughs> I love you, brother. Thank you for the show. Talk Thanks, to you Gary. Bye -bye. Good